got two of these lovely Alouette threes. Um, the grey one sitting over there, and now this one that you just completed, ZURBI. Um, how, Rudy, how long did it take you to build Rudy? Well, perhaps let me start at the beginning. Um, it all started during my national service in 1974. I was called up to the Air Force to do 24 months of, uh, of voluntary. I was called up to do voluntary <laughs> service. Um, of 24 months and as I say, fortunate enough, uh, I went to Air Force Gym and then my posting was to Air Force Base SWAT Corps. I was assigned to Light Aircraft Command in those days. It used to control the, the bush the war, uh, the, the, you know, the, the lighter aircraft being the choppers and the Cessnas and the horse box, etc. And I also did two tours of duty up to uh, the Caprivi, Hindu. So I had a lot to do with all these airplanes and the pilots and the goings on on a daily basis and it was a fantastic time of my life and I always thought I wonder if I'd ever have the opportunity to fly one of these machines because you know we, we all thought the pilots were gods and that's how they were treated and uh, it was just quite um, overwhelming to see how it all operated and how the war continued and uh, how these machines performed friend of mine, ex-airline captain, owned a one uh, LO2 that had been quite badly neglected and there again also bad mouth by a few people. Um, so he was battling to sell it. And I suppose the fact that I had the foresight from building the, the, uh, the, the numerous 182s, I could see the potential of rebuilding and getting this, this uh, LO2 on the go. So that I think was about 12 or 15 years ago. I bought the LO2 and did the upholstery and touched up the paint and changed the engine and uh, you know spent quite a bit of time and effort on it and that was through Warbirds of, of Wonderboer. And once it was ready to fly, I wasn't even licensed to fly at home. So I got uh, Hugo Fisser, who was licensed on a, on a LO2 fly to Petit for me because that's where I had found Hangerich and uh, I then started my training with uh, Paul Daw. He was a uh, training captain with, uh, with uh, British Airways Kaluda at the time, Kame, and he was a, a DE instructor on helicopters. So he then took me through my paces and got me involved in helicopters. And how much time do you have on helicopters now? I've probably got 800 hours total time on uh, LOs, being LO2 and LO3, and probably just over 500 hours on LO3. Um, LO2 is probably 300 odd. Yeah. My, my, and my total time, fixed wing, I'm probably sitting at uh, 1800 to 2000. And do you ever have a yearning to go back and fly fixed wing airplanes again? Well, that's why I bought um, ZS ROB and Avion mm -hmm. because I was actually looking for a, a, a Bospok. I have flown and uh, in civilian life flown Bospok and I was converted to type and I, I flew a Bospok for many years and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I found it the most challenging fixed wing. And I think because it was challenging, I really enjoyed it. So I looked for another one, but um, it was difficult to find the right one. And then um, this Navion that was built in 1947, that actually served with the, with the United States uh, Navy in 1947 during the um, Korean conflict. In fact, it was used to train the pilots to do uh, aircraft carrier landings. That um, was on the market and I liked its versatility, its speed, its power, its wonderful looks, its history and uh, I bought that and that I bought at the end of uh, 2020 to keep my, um, my fixed wing interest uh, alive at bay. Mm -hmm. And this one does, you need, you need something all you need change all the time otherwise you get it. But we still love helicopters. So normally on Saturday morning when 
everybody arrives at the airfield, and that's what I found with the LO2. Um, I actually owned the two and the first three simultaneously, and every time I wanted to fly the two, I had people that said, ah, if you fly, can, I, can we come with? And the two never had the, the payload, so it's like, okay, then we'll just take the three. So the, end of the, T, the, the two ended up sitting in the hangar, never being flown. And some guy during COVID offered to buy it, and uh, I knew the green one was you know, in the process of being completed. It was difficult enough to fly two helicopters, never, never mind three helicopters, <laughs> so I then sold the LO2. What year is Rudy? Rudy was built, was bought by the Air Force in 19, 1973. 1973. Uh, yeah, so it was probably built in 72 and acquired by the Air Force in 73 or 74. I think it's 74. Mm -hmm. 74. Um, so it was probably in the year that I did my national service. I was in 74 and 75. And I could tell you I did much flying in all the aircraft at Air Force Base SWAT Corps. So I can't say um, whether I flew in Romeo and Charlie or uh, well, And I must tell you that Charles's wife, Maria, has told me that Rudy, because I now call RDI Rudy for short, she says it's a male Rudy and not a female Rudy. Because <laughs> he doesn't want us fitting with females at the hangar. So just by the way, the, 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 I'm sticking the, um, the, the, the Navy on, mm -hmm. is Z-U-R-O-B. That's right. I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And that was purely coincidental. Purely coincidental. <laughs> and in fact, when Charles and I went to look at it, Charles photographed it and sent a picture to his son, Enzo. And Enzo's immediate response was, Ah, oh, this one robs the police dash dies and I'm his car. So... That's how it all happened. That's how it all happened. As part, of the re as part of the rebuild being a military chopper, I wanted to retain the military feel as much as possible, but at the same time keep, you know, make it a little more civilian friendly. So the idea was to retain the markings. Initially, the grey one had the old South African flag on it, which I retained. This um, squadron uh, shield was actually blue in colour. And it had a little um, swallow on it as, as the emblem for the, the, the squadron with some Latin depicted down below. But because it's still an active squadron in, um, in Bloomsplate, the helicopter training squadron, we had to change it a little because I couldn't really use the shield as, um, you know, to continue marking the helicopter. So I, I put a picture of my dog onto it in the first place and we changed the Latin to read Ludera Semper Tempus, which translates to I'll take spiel tight. So in other words, always a fun time. So quite an interesting little part of it. And the, and the, the old um, Air Force emblem was the castle with the spring bocky, and uh, we've been able to retain that because, as you know, the uh, Air Force emblem changed to the new dispensations emblem. So nobody is too worried about that. Okay, so the engine is still fairly similar to what the, what the military um, make use of. Uh, it's a standard R23 um, engine, uh, very reliable, very powerful, and also thirsty engine. It, it burns uh, 200 litres of um, paraffin an hour, or, or jet fuel an hour. So it's not the cheapest to run, but it's got lots of power and very reliable. This is the, um, the particle separator that the South African Air Force developed during the days of Bush War to prevent all the, the semi-desert type sand destroying engines. It was a wonderful invention that they came up with and uh, still a wonderful piece of equipment today. And uh, in fact a lot of the more modern helicopters are fitted with a very similar type situation. This is the accessory gearbox that's fitted to the front of the engine, the turbine engine. Um, and that's the actual combustion area, and that's the jet pipe down that end, which then drives the venturis for the, for the engine oil cooler, as well as the um, suction of the particles out of the particle separator. Um, the engine is it's quite basic, uh, but very sophisticated for its time. It's able to uh, start itself. 
with the heat of the, you know, with the um, switch of the, of the button, whereas a lot of the new turbines, you know, they have to watch the, the, the temperature and the speed and when they add fuel, whereas this very basic um, electromechanical control module, control box, controls the starting of this engine uh, faultlessly 99% um, of the time, as long as all the little components that feed the information to, the, to this electromechanical box works beautifully. Uh, I think the French were wonderful in, in that they were able to design all this and that was probably done in the, in the late or, or mid 50s so that the helicopter could come on stream in the 60s and to think that those systems were, were so well put together then that they still work so well today I think is wonderful. Sort of to, to continue with the, the design and the French being so wonderful in their ability to design these machines, they designed this step ladder effect that the engineer or even the pilot was able to gain access to the, to the main um, gearbox mass and rotor head because the helicopter was very maintenance hungry, it needed to be maintained on a regular basis. In fact, every five hours the system has to be greased. So each pivot point on the head, which is quite a sophisticated articulated head, has a grease nipple, and that grease nipple has to be cleaned and greased. So if they were out in the bush and they were doing five hours a day, that meant the helicopter had to be lubricated um, at least once a day. So that's why they allowed all this. And then also allowed the pilot or the engineer to inspect all the linkages and the little bearings and the bolts on the various um, belt cranks and control linkages, as well as the clutch. This is the um, centrifugal clutch that drives the, the main gearbox together with the three wheel unit. So in the event of an engine failure, the three wheel unit will allow the rotor head and gearbox to continue turning to allow you to or allow the pilot to go through a uh, auto rotation type landing. Okay, the, the tail rotor of the helicopter is rather important for the obvious reasons. Um, this being quite a powerful um, tail rotor system in that it operates three blades instead of the, the two that the uh, LA2 used to operate, so the additional power in the engine requires more um, anti-torque um, thrust, hence three blades to allow for the, um, for the uh, increased horses in the, in the engine on the three. Um, it, quite, it can be quite a vulnerable area of the, of the helicopter, hence the um, tail rotor guard or the, or the bee sting as they call it sometimes, so if the pilot landed a little bit um, hurriedly and he, the tail was a little bit too low so instead of wiping out the tail rotor the tail rotor guard would um, give him the feel of where the tail was and he'd know exactly he's done he's overcooked the landing and uh, he would correct and prevent a nasty situation the uh, instrument panel at the Air Force utilized at the time uh, no fancy GPS's or anything like that so the, the pilots had quite a, a difficult time navigating through the bush which had very rudimentary um, uh, charts so the, the um, navigation and dead reckoning had to be spot on the, the um, uh, radio compass which is quite a accurate instrument in terms of heading uh, is what they really relied on um, it doesn't really need to be aligned with the standard um, compass uh, it, it uses um, you know a magnetic uh, flux valve to, to align it so it's quite accurate and that's what they used uh, at the time when I rebuilt we, we repaired and cleaned and, and re overhauled certain of the instruments where necessary um, removed a lot of the uh, military radios and um, all the, the avionics that was specific to uh, Air Force to Army and Air Force to, to SAP and um, so the, the, the aircraft had this, this particular one had many um, comms panels that were positioned all over the place with other radios and other press to talk buttons so whatever this one was used for at the end of its life in the Air Force um, 
necessitated all these additional radios. So that clutter was all removed. I've retained the two uh, VHF comms, which are Collins radios with just remote dials. The actual uh, workings of the radio are in the belly of the, he of the helicopter, so it also <coughs> deals with CFG a lot better than having a heavy radio here up front. Um, so the, the actual workings of the radio under the belly and this just then controls your frequencies. So those we've now retained, very powerful 20 watts, whereas the standard um, uh, commercial type VHF is 10 watts. And then I had to put in a decent um, civilian type uh, comms panel and of course a, a GPS, not a GPS, a, a transponder with uh, altitude encoding. The seats also had to be redone. They were rather rudimentary bits of sponge rubber, rubber covered by um, canvas. So we had to, to have the seats remolded almost to be a little bit body hugging and you know to create a little more um, comfort and, and uh, security uh, when seated in the seat. So uh, you know it was that was something that we had to work on to get the right depths right width so that you could sit comfortably and then of course uh, leather and uh, you know the leather has to pass the, the flame the flame proof test so all that had to be done by the, the uh, by the contractor or by the uh, upholsterer that did the upholstery and uh, we changed the seat belts and likewise seat belts had to be done by authorized seat belt restorer so there is quite a lot to be done when uh, you know, to be kept in mind when, when, when we're building an aircraft, you've got to comply with all the safety requirements. Yeah. And I, in fact, this helicopter also we closed in the ceiling because um, it's just a little bit more VIP, I suppose, having the ceiling um, closed in because otherwise the, the cabling, you know, that comes to the fuse, fuse holders and the switches is all exposed here and it's not the most attractive um, civilian feature. In military, I suppose, it wasn't an issue. So it was just something we did and uh, closed up the ceiling here. And of course, we repainted all the interior. This used to be black uh, from a, from a um, I suppose, from a, uh, a military point of view, they didn't want the, the, the helicopter too visible, either in the park position or in the flying position. So everything was black, all the, all the, uh, the flooring, Everything was black, and uh, of course the, 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 uh, the bulkhead at the back was, was all black, so that was all painted while well, we had it stripped, so that we wouldn't overspray windows or seats or anything like that. Did my conversion to type, and he very kindly put this uh, checklist together, and he said to me, "Now you've got a checklist. Make sure you use it at all times." So it's actually a wonderful flight aid to have. Every time one flies, one makes use. Okay, so here we go. Before start checks, seat harnesses and pedals, okay, my harnesses are tight, passengers all good, pedals are set. Battery master, on, generator, on. Doors are closed, we're going to close the doors once you're ready to fly. Cyclic is uh, neutral and friction is adjusted, the collective is full low and the friction is adjusted. The brakes are applied, the server control is open, the fuel flow is closed, the shutoff cock is full forward, the RMI adjust is down and wire locked, that's over there. The radios are off, uh, the engine selector is off, we do the start lights, one, two, three start lights working, the booster pump, Booster pump is working, the fuel low level warning light is working, the rotor brake is to the front and the brake is released, the volts are 25, uh, other warning lights, fuel filter and transmission oil are working, instruments uh, 060, 060, 5350, 0, good. All that looks good. We need to just set the clock and because we need a stopwatch. Instruments are all looking good. Yeah. Circuit breakers are all in except the landing light. The uh, AH and DG are caged. All the other switches are off except those I've switched on. Now we switch on the fuel pump and build up fuel pressure. 
once we hit the start button and then hit the the um, stopwatch and within two to seven seconds well the engine will start spooling up and within two to seven seconds the micro pump will come on put some fuel into the engine and it should start here we have the engine rpm but there's a second needle in there which indicates rotor speed